Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is kind of an informal discussion on redeeming the straw man. My name is Kent Hovind. With me is John D'Arcy from South Florida. Thank you, John. Nice of you to drive all the way up to visit us here in Enjoy. Pensacola. America's in trouble. Uh, we have a lot of people confused about what's going on. Uh, this will be just kind of an informal discussion about a variety. It ties on a variety of topics, but where are our rights? Our founding fathers said, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. They're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, rights that you just can't put a lien against. And what we want to try to do is just explain where we lost it and how to get it back. Just try to keep it simple so folks like me can understand it. Basically, God created the universe. We've got a little chart here behind me that kind of explains God created people. This would be Kent Hovind, John D.R.C., you know, John Doe, etc., etc. We, the people, got together 200 years ago and created a state government. All of those states got together and created a federal government. And the federal government is supposed to be the servant to the state government. States are supposed to be supreme, states' rights, which goes into a long story of the wrong side winning the Civil War, right? Exactly. What was the Civil War? <laughs> what was the Civil War? It's Abe Lincoln's War. It wasn't the Civil War. That's right. It wasn't slavery. It wasn't slavery, no. And then the federal government created a corporate federal government. Notice it's all capital letters. The corporate federal government created a corporate state government. And one of these two, somewhere in here, created persons with all capital letters. This would be Kent Hovind with all capital letters. This is not me. Which leaves us with an interesting situation. Since whatever God creates, he controls, and we're supposed to be subservient to God, whatever we create, we control, and the states, the federal and state government are supposed to be subservient to we, the people. They're supposed to be our servants. But whatever the government creates, it controls. So the government has created persons, a, actually a corporate soul, for every individual being in the United States. There is a corporate Kent Hovind and a corporate John D'Arcy. And they can pass all sorts of rules and regulations for their corporation, <coughs> which they own and control and regulate, etc. Now, they're using my name, though. They created a corporation and chose my name to go on there and chose your name to go on one and everybody else's name to go on one. So they've kind of abused their privilege and stepped out of their uh, uh, delegated authority and used my name. So that leaves me with four choices to, to take. Number one, I can do what they say, which is what most Americans do. The state government can tell their person, you must wear a seatbelt when you drive your car. They can tell this person, uh, you must file an income tax form. Uh, you must get a social security number. You must get a driver's license. You must get a birth certificate, et cetera, et cetera. And they have the right to tell that to this person. So I can either say, okay, I'll do what you say. <clears throat> I can bring myself from here all the way down and s submit myself under these corporations. Or I can try to cut the string between this we the, me, we the people, and the artificial we the people. I can try to cut that string. And some people do that with varying degrees of success. Number three, um, I can look for loopholes in the laws and say, well, wait a minute, uh, this law doesn't require that I do this. And some people, with varying degrees of success, look for loopholes and say, wait a minute, the state does not require persons to file a tax form unless they are a drug dealer from the Virgin Islands or uh, live in Washington, D.C., or use a zip code, and all sorts of different arguments have been used, and some, right. not, some not too successful. Choice number four is claim this guy. Say, hey, you're using my name. That's mine. I want it. That's what I want John to explain to us today. How do we redeem that straw man? And what does that mean, redeeming that straw man and moving him or claiming him as your own? John, tell, tell us about that. Well, redemption is basically very biblically grounded. Oh, yes, right. And it is the, the, the soul of, of the Christian's belief that we ultimately, our souls are redeemed through Jesus Christ. And all we have to do is accept his finished work on the cross and we are eternally redeemed and Christ then protects and holds our soul for all eternity. So it's, it's very biblically based and it's funny that no matter how corrupt things seem to be getting, government seems to follow God's law. Mm -hmm. You ever wonder why every seven years you can file a bankruptcy and not 12? 
or yeah, why, why seven? Just yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, it, the, the the Bible talks about things like that in in year of jubilee and things like that, and um, there, there's an, another principle about giving your fellow man notice and grace. And a lot of people might say, well, why? How can you call that just for a God to take a heathen in Africa who never saw the Bible and expect him to have knowledge of Jesus Christ? And and Isaiah talks about how God has given everyone notice. Then shall it be for a man to burn, for he will take thereof and warm himself. Yea, he kindleth it and breaketh bread. Yea, he maketh a god and worshipeth it. He maketh it a graven image and falleth down thereto. So we see one type of man that looks at God's nature and he does not marvel at it, but he has rejected God's uh, general revelation as, as opposed to object it in stark contradiction with what David does. Yeah, David looked at himself and said, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made uh, in the book of Psalms, you know. Uh, and as a biology teacher, I would agree, you know, all you got to do is study anything about human anatomy or biology, and you'll say, man, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. One cell more complex than a space shuttle. Amen. It's unbelievable, you know. The best thing man can build is, you know, God <laughs> builds trillions and trillions of them, you know. <laughs> yeah. So we got got the two type of people there, and... Uh, uh, so, so man is not without excuse that God has testified to man. And if man accepts God's general revelation, then God is faithful and he will send him specific revelation, meaning the Bible and knowledge of Jesus Christ. So the heathen that, that's out in the middle of the jungles in Africa who does not have a Bible, he will be held accountable to the revelation and knowledge he has, meaning nature. So that is a very basic principle of law that we have to give notice and grace. And just as God gives us notice and grace, in law, would anybody be surprised to find out that there are very elements of notice and grace that are given? And that, that is a very, uh, what I consider to be a biblical principle that is very prominent in this whole concept of redeeming your straw man. The the other uh, uh, wait a minute. So you're saying it's in God's economy or God's plan or God's character. Give notice mm -hmm. of what you expect. That's right. And what you want. That's right. And then the grace is a time period to, in which to accomplish this. That's right. Okay. Okay. And and the other concept that I see here is we we've got a mirror. Okay. And we have God. And he's perfect, he's holy, he's just. And the flip side to that would be Satan. And he is the exact opposite of what is holy and what is just. Right? He's evil. And God, only God, can create real, tangible things. You know, paper, sure. and matter, wood, time, and, right. And so <clears throat> Satan cannot. So all he is left doing is counterfeiting. And he's a great counterfeiter. And that is the other principle that we find out here in the straw man, is that whatever God created, Satan's got his counterfeit to. And man turns around and man created real de jure government. The government turned around and created a fiction. And I like to think of the state, in fact, when we start talking about government, when I mention the word state, I think of the state that is created in the womb, mankind. Okay. That is real government. And our founding father said, there is where the basis of all government, you know, it, it's, it's held within mankind. Right. The, the executive, legislative, and judicial. Even in Genesis chapter 10, after the flood, God told Noah, he, he established government. He said, Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man, shall his blood be shed. That's a great point. You're right. And, and we have our dispensational theology, and we have covenant theology. And a lot of times I meet people who want to throw away covenant theology 
and say we're under dispensational theology. And then other people that want to say there's no dispensations and they're all covenant theology. And the, the other point that I think is important is uh, we can't sit here and say, well, we're under grace, let's throw law out. Because very clearly, law does apply in our life. If you don't believe so, go jump off a 10-story building. You'll find out how quickly law applies. The law of gravity is it's applying a, all the constantly, right? A circle has 360 degrees. Whether you like it or not. Exactly. <laughs> sure. So, but, but law does not affect our justification. Okay? Um, but if we keep certain laws, we might live a lot longer and be healthier. Right. Okay? And, and so we are not justified by keeping that law. But that's why I say, although a lot of these concepts in the straw man are there in the law, Old Testament, they still apply because we have not ultimately uh, become totally sanctified yet. Mm -hmm. Someday when we reach total sanctification, none of this will be uh, relevant as opposed to uh, the law and we will uh, have new bodies, we won't be able to sin and things like that. Um, so I guess that, that's the, the, the basis for uh, redeeming the straw man. Well, tell me, you, you mentioned an illustration that seems to make a lot of sense about McDonald's. Mm -hmm. Tell us that about, Mc, what yeah. about McDonald's. Yeah, that, that's pretty interesting. Okay, If we were to go out today and just start building a McDonald's franchise, but we never paid our license fees and we never told McDonald's about it, just we, did it. we just figured they got you know millions of stores they'll never know we could probably you know get away with that and keep going and sticking the money in our pocket now most Christians I know would probably say ooh John that's very unethical All right? but as long as we didn't get caught we could get away with it okay in essence that's what's happened to us they have created a straw man and they are using this entity and as long as we don't show up to say, hey, you can't do that, they're going to go keep on using that. Okay, so since they created this and used your name. That's right. If you, as long as you don't say anything, well. They, they keep they're going. They keep using it, sure. And, and it gets worse than that because we take ourselves out of a, a position where we are accountable to God and we come on down and we say, we will I'll become that person for you. And we take ourselves out of a position of being their master and put ourselves in a position of being becoming the servant. the servant. Have churches done the same thing by becoming incorporated? That's a very interesting issue. Uh, this the, will the 501c3 corporation. There's a uh, U.S. Supreme Court case named Hale v. Hinkle. And in that court case, they basically stated that a corporation is a creature of the state. Okay. All right. Let's follow this analogy through um, with an illustration. Uh, let's take your phone number, for instance. Okay. Who owns that phone number? Good question. I guess I have to pay every month for it, so the, the company owns it. So the I'm phone renting. company, basically. Yeah. If we stop meeting our contractual obligation, mainly, paying our phone bill, They'll take it away and give it to somebody else. They, exactly. Sure, right. and, and you'll see how long that phone right. number is yours. <laughs> 30 days. All right? So the same thing with a corporation. That corporation is a creature of the state. Okay? You have to apply to the state. Okay? You fill out all these articles in the corporation, and it has to be follow the guidelines that the state sets. All right? Once they get these articles from the corporation, and you pay a fee to the state, they will stamp that thing in, and, and you become a corporation. All right? But they've got some... You just like that phone bill, they've got some guidelines you got to follow. Well, you got to file this tax return every year. You got to, you know, uh, file your your minutes. You've got to pay a, a fee every year to use that corporation. And if you don't pay your fee every year, you can't even defend a lawsuit that comes along. So a corporation is the creature of a state, and it does not exist as a matter of right. See, God never created corporation. But it is down in this world existing as an entity of privilege. And who ultimately owns that corporation? Well, the state. Whoever created it. The state, the state created it, so they if own it. If it's Utah or California or Florida. 
and the, the stockholders basically have a beneficial interest in the use of that corporation. Very interesting. So a 501c3 is nothing more than a, another type of a corporation. The state owns it. So now, when they come in, and I believe, Ken, that this is just around the corner, and a lot of churches are going to get really caught off guard by this, but I think they're going to be in very shortly saying, well, you have to have, if, if your church has 3,000 members, you're going to have to have an equal pro rata share of queer ministers on staff. Sure. And if you don't have a queer minister, uh, they could revoke that tax status. And you want to say, well, man, isn't that unconstitutional? No, not really. They created it. Yep, and it's just like that, that scenario with McDonald's. Okay? Um, if you want to sell uh, Grandma Hovine's one-pound hamburgers, you can do that. But once you enter into a franchise agreement with McDonald's, you can't sell Grandma Hovine's hamburgers. You have to sell what they tell me to sell. You have to, yeah. exactly. So, so if we have left our position with God and we uh, have elected to become this corporate franchise, and they say you will have queer ministers. At that point in time, I think it, as Christians, it becomes a matter of are we going to honor our contracts? Yes. So I think it's more important to watch what we're doing and be careful the contracts we get into if we don't want to have to follow the terms of those contracts later. Well, see, in Proverbs chapter 6, it says, uh, if you've stricken your hand with a stranger, you know, you made a contract, mm -hmm. try to get out of it. Do your best to undo that, right. especially an unending contract. If I say, John, I'm going to hire you for $10 an hour to work for me, well, I probably should have an end to that, you know, to work for me until this project is completed, and in case it's taking longer than I thought, then we have a cutoff deadline of, yeah. you know. Unending contracts are dangerous, you know, you've got to be very cautious about that, and Proverbs chapter 6 warns us about that. So, I get, lot, I get some flack from other Christians because uh, we have not incorporated. I am not 501c3. I don't want to take... God told me to go preach his word, okay? Right. I don't need the state's permission to do what God already told me to do. And people who have taken the state's permission look at me like I'm some, some kind of odd duck, like why aren't you incorporated and why haven't you jumped through all these hoops? Well, John Bunyan spent years in jail over this very issue. He refused to take a state license to preach. Right. The government said, you must get a license to preach. He said, I'm sorry. If I do that, that's putting God under you guys. I can't put God under you. Amen. And so, I don't understand why some Christians get bent out of shape with me about that. Uh, I'm trying to do what God told me to do. <laughs> okay, yeah, that, that, that's a, another interesting thing. we got these uh, little citizens' rule books here. And in this rule book, there's a story, um, you know, give me liberty, give me death about uh, Patrick Henry was shocked and he served on the jury here in this country around 1775 where they were wanting a man to take a license to preach and he was a juror and he says no way you can't do that and they wound up at throwing him in jail as a juror until he they weren't going to let him out until he agreed to find the guy guilty and he was willing to stay there in jail and lose his business a lot of Christians might say, well, how? what kind of a testimony is that? He wound up in jail. But still, he did the right thing. Right. And, and finally, the, the, he was covered in his own thesis. He, they, had, they finally let him out because he, he wouldn't find the guy guilty. I'm going to die here. He's not guilty. And that's an, another sad truth is that the judges are telling everybody when you serve on a jury that it has to be unanimous one way or another. And the truth is, if one juror says the guy's not guilty there's your reasonable doubt. That's exactly correct. Okay, one juror says no. And a juror can do that if he thinks the law is unjust. That's right. It doesn't matter. It, okay, so you pass a law, you can't spit on the sidewalk. Somebody spits on the sidewalk. He goes to court. You know, gets tried. It's obvious he broke the law. But is the law reasonable? And That's if the right. juror says, no, that law is not reasonable. Throw it out. Throw it out. The, the, the juror simply votes not guilty. Even though it's obvious he's guilty for breaking the law, the jurors vote of not guilty because the law is unjust is all that's necessary. And that's all right. jurors only knew that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I, you guys sell these here, and this is just a great book. Yeah, like I, a dollar or something. You've got to give them yeah. what everybody you know. You know, you know I, I, I really think people, would, you know, they call them, they, they order some tapes from me, they really need to, you know, order 
three or four of these because you need to get them out and give them to your children and things like that. And you, it's an awesome book. These have been given out all over Santa Rosa County, which is the next county over from us. Mm -hmm. And their court system is really having a good time because of this because the jurors know their rights. You know, having, awesome. having an informed jury is just really helpful. So, okay, back to the McDonald's issue. Uh, I started McDonald's. I'm making a bunch of money. Things are going fine. But you own the real McDonald's. That's right. You are Mr. What's his name? Croc. Mr. Or? Ray Croc. Mr. Ray Croc. Okay. So you come to me and say, Hey, Kent Hovind, um, sorry, you can't use my name anymore. That's right. Now you've got problems. Right. But uh, and until the real McDonald's Corporation showed up and is saying you can't use our name, you, you've been making a lot of money. Things have been working good for you. True. And, and that's a scenario that's been going on right now. The government's using our name. That's right, and they're making all these laws and regulations for this guy. You got to pay all kinds of taxes. You got to get a license for a church. You got to get a license to blow your nose, and, and a license to have children, and a license to to death. And the, the truth is, they can't make people have a license to, to to have children, things like that. I hate to keep interrupting you here, but I want to understand this. Okay, uh, my son, when he got married, elected not to get a marriage license. Mm -hmm. You don't need state's permission to do something God said you can do. God That's ordains right. marriage. Okay, right. And I get some Christians even today that still don't understand. You know, that They think I'm some kind of radical. I guess it's because everybody's been doing this for so long. Yes. And when somebody comes along and says, hey, I've got my freedom, they don't understand it. See, or they resent it or they're jealous of it or something. Exactly. I don't know what it is. In, in, no, I have a lot of appreciation for the battle Christ was fighting with tradition. Right. What do you mean? My parents got the marriage license. Their parents got the. And it's really tradition that we're following, in in you know not God's law. And uh, marriage is a very interesting interesting topic, and uh, everyone's just so familiar with going ahead and getting that license. Well, let's just take that. For, t explain. If you get a marriage license from the state, you don't need the state's permission to get married. Okay, That's obviously. Correct. But if you decide to do that, that becomes a contract. That's right. Now, contractual law is very different than constitutional law. That's right. The Constitution gives us as people the right to make all the contracts we want. That's right. If I say, John, I'm going to pay you $1,000 an hour for the rest of my life, sign the contract. Of course, I'd be stupid to do that, but hey, if I signed the contract and didn't fulfill it, you take me to the local court, they find me guilty, That's they right. throw me in jail, take away all my property, and give it to you to pay the debt. That's right. And I can stand there all day long and say, I've got a constitutional right. Well, yes, you do, but I made the contract. That's right. And that's why I was a fool. You that's know, what Proverbs 6 warns us about. It's kind of interesting. You talk a lot about when people ask you, Ken, do you think we should be teaching creation in public schools? And you, I, I like the way you say, well, you're asking the wrong question. Let's talk about, should we have public schools first? Then that second question kind of that, takes care of itself. That's the real question. And what, what they're doing to us, they're, they're giving us the same sucker punch. You know, they're setting us up doing this and then they're about, about to pop punches over here and the, this thing about same-sex marriage comes up and the real issue isn't same-sex marriage right let's talk about the real question is can the state sanction and create a marriage any well, marriage no same they sex can't. otherwise yeah. they can't so once they've got the the christians to buy into this idea that it's the state that creates the marriage that then well if they can create a marriage now they can define the terms, whether it's male, male, female, female. Sure. And uh, because we've already we've already given them the right to make make the decision. They don't have right. the right to make the decision. That's right. So so you know, and, and there's some other interesting things that happen. I, I know here in Florida, there's language to this effect that says that the fruits of the marriage shall be deemed wards of the state. Okay. So if you produce children, you produce children. All right. Now if they are wards of the state, and they say don't spank the state's children. It's a simple matter of contract. Don't spank. Don't, don't sit there and say, well, the Bible says that I have to. The, the, the matter is, what do you do with your children? And you gave them to the state, so you made a contract. Exactly. Okay, suppose somebody did that. Somebody's watching this tape and they say, hey, I did that. I got a marriage license and I spanked my kid and I'm in trouble. HRS or whoever's after me now. Are we getting ahead of ourselves? How to get out of that? Uh, how to undo the damage by making that contract? Or right, you want to cover that later? Or is this a good time? I, I think, uh, you know, I had somebody call me about that uh, last week. Okay. And they, th their idea was, well, should we go and get a divorce now? <laughs> well, no, don't get a, don't further v validate the thing by getting a divorce. 
You know, because what are you saying? You're sitting there saying, well, we recognize that we had one of these marriages. Now we're trying to go and seek further uh, what remedy from somebody that created damage already. Right. You know? um, I, I think the, the, the truth of the matter is, is was there ever a bona fide contract where all the terms and conditions were held on, on, on the table? <laughs> um, and so I don't recommend doing things like trying to get a divorce and all this, all this no. stuff. Can you s fill out papers, send them to the, take them to the courthouse, have them file stamped, that undoes your marriage license? At least, to, at least undoes the contract with the state. Well, would, what I like to do is go ahead and include that marriage license within our filing on our commercial affairs. So basically, that j just like what we're going to be doing with the straw man, where we've been filing a UCC. Uh, one financing statement against the character down here laying a claim by the real man against the straw man, every one of these quasi-contracts is going to be named within that UCC filing. Okay, so they made 6, 8, 10, 20 contracts. Mm -hmm. <coughs> these, each of these contracts, marriage license, social security number, driver's license, whatever. Mm-hmm. You lay claim to those. Right. So then it doesn't matter. So now if the state says you can't spank your children, you say, excuse me, I own this contract. You don't own this contract anymore. That's right. So that's really the proper way to get out of this, isn't it? It totally flips everything. Okay. And it does that work? I mean, in reality? It has been working all over the country very well. And once the process is done right, it's been working very well. And ultimately I know this eventually we are going to get to the point where nothing works and the powers to be are going to say this bow down and worship the beast the or abomination else. of desolations yeah. and at that point nothing is going to work and it's either worship the beast or not now I'm fairly pre-trib rapture in my thinking and I don't believe the Christians are going to have to go through that period. I believe we will be raptured out of here before then. Um, but inevitably, we are approaching a point when nothing is actually going to work. You're going to have to stand for what's right, and it's going to cost you. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And, and ultimately, my opinion right now is I think in the, the last days there is going to be a great revival. But if you look at all the great revivals, and if you look at when the the gospel of Christ was spreading, it was over the backs and deaths of the martyrs. And I think, you know, it, it kind of reminds me of the, the story of the two comrades standing on the corner, and uh, the one guy said to his, his fellow comrade, Comrade, if you had two houses, would you give me one? Yes, comrade, I'm a good Communist Party member. If I had two houses, I would give you one. Comrade, if you had two cars, would you give me one? Yes, comrade. I'm a good communist. If I had two cars, I would give you one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, comrade, one more question. If you had two shirts, would you give me one? His comrade spit at him and walked away. Well, why? What happened? I have two shirts. <laughs> right, and it's kind of a, the same thing in this country. For years, Christians have been saying, "Yes, I will die for Christ," but then they get get ashamed to go to a restaurant and bow their head and let everybody see that they're praying. The guys at work, they're going to ridicule me. So, God so far has not been asking us to die for Him. He's been asking us to live for Him, and we're not even doing that. And if we're ashamed to live for Him, yeah. and let, like Romans two, twelve says. You know, to present ourselves a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable. If we're not even going to be willing to have our feelings hurt for him, what would happen if the day came that we are asked to pay the ultimate and give our life for him? I see it as the frog in the pot analogy. We slowly raise the temperature. Christians keep saying, I'll never take the mark of the beast. Well, now, slow down. You already took the contracts. You already took the Social Security number. Yes. You already took all the licenses. You already took yourself out from under God's authority. Don't tell me you won't take the mark. You will take the mark. And I think we're going to be shocked at how many 
Christians can't succumb to the pressure when it reaches that point. Like, you know, they're heating up the furnace now. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and there's gonna, only going to be three that don't bow. <laughs> That's what happened. You figure they took 7,000 Jewish young men captive, brought them to Babylon, trained them in the Babylonian language, Babylonian customs, and when he built that statue and said, bow down and worship it, 6,997 of those Jewish boys bowed down. They'd been taught all their life, don't bow to statues. Well, they did anyway. Yep. I mean, when you're looking at the furnace and looking at the statue, okay, you bow down and kiss the dirt. And I think this mark of the beast, when it says he causeth all to receive a mark in the right hand or the forehead, mm -hmm. and without the mark, you can't buy or sell, it's real easy for us to sit here and say, I'll never take that mark. Well, just wait till you're hungry. Yes. Yeah, and that's exactly what happened in the Depression. Sure. You know, everybody's hungry. Stand in line to take that mark. And, and that's what that's how they create the crisis on purpose. The depression was purposely created so that people would line up to take this number. And they're going to do another depression or something so that people will line up to get the mark. Give me my chip. I want to go to the store and buy something. That's it's coming. That's coming very soon. It's coming soon to a town. Okay, to you. here we are. We've gotten all these contracts: marriage license, driver's license, etc. Give us uh, practical steps. Step one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What do you recommend average person do? First of all, I think people really need to start studying and getting themselves up to speed. Where do they on, get information? On, on, study on, one. on where they're at. They're at. And uh, there's a whole series of good books that helps get you, gets you up to speed. You know, and a lot of times people say, "John, are you talking conspiracy theories?" And I say this: either you believe your Bible or not. And the Bible says there's a one world government coming and there is going to be this thing called an abomination of desolation. Right? Now, to me, that is the conspiracy. That right. Satan has been conspiring against God for all ages and that is what everything is heading to. So, um, yes, I believe there's a conspiracy theory and, and it's authored by Satan himself. Yeah, Satan versus God. It's not a smoke-filled room someplace. That's right. Right. So, so now um, there's a lot of books like uh, the Federal Mafia, the the Creature from Jekyll Island. Um, there's a book you guys offer uh, here at the ministry about uh, World Without Cancer. All of that deals with cancer. Man, it is awesome to read that book and see how I.G. Fairbin and, and the Rockefellers and and uh, uh, the Duponts and and just all these guys are are together in this thing and. That is just a little taste of what happened with the medical industry, but what happened with the medical industry happened with law, happened with psychiatry, happened with even the churches, um, in, you know, through this 501c3 thing. And it's amazing what, what happened. So, yeah, there's a lot of good books that people can get. And I say the first thing is, is we start talking about the straw man, there's a lot of things that happened to get up to the point where we are today. Right, and so there, there's a lot of these good books that I think that they can get and they can start reading. Um, you know what I don't recommend. I don't recommend that people, you know, watch a tape like this and then say, "I'm going to stop paying my taxes," and they have no idea what they're doing. You know, get themselves in trouble, go off half cocked. Right, and exactly because but there's some people who who that code obviously applies to. All right, and there's certain people that don't. You know, I've got a friend that came over here from Germany. He doesn't file a tax return, all right? And obviously, he doesn't need to. But there's a lot of other people who don't need to file that return either. Right. And I'm not in a position to say whether you are, should be filing that return or not. You've got to look at your own scenario, look at the law, study the law, and make that determination for yourself. Sure, and I've spent a long time studying that and trying to look and trying to put this in perspective. Jesus said the root of uh, the love of money is the root of all evil. That's correct. And what we have here is some people who have a, a strong love of money, Rockefellers, etc., and who have worked to make us all their slaves. Right. You charge something on your credit card, they get two or three percent. They didn't do a thing. It's amazing. It's amazing. They're really raking in the dough. They are. They loan the money to the government so that they can collect the interest off of that loan. They'll even create a war. Country A fights country B. We'll loan both of them money. And we'll let them kill themselves. Let them kill most of them. We've got to keep a few left to pay off this debt, because after all, they do all this money, you know. 
put a stop to the war when we're ready. Now you both start paying back this money because you don't recycle much on a forty thousand dollar bomb. Right. You know, <laughs> you get twenty cents worth of scrap metal. You know, so uh, they make a fortune on this. Right. And so if you if we can keep in mind Jesus' words, the love of money is the root of all evil, and that Satan does indeed want to rule this world, and he hates humanity. Then it starts to make sense of how we've got this 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 problem. Yes. We've, we've allowed it to be created. Now. To redeem the straw man, to, to lay claim to this, mm -hmm. you help people do this. Yes. They say, first of all, they need to study and know what they're doing. Make sure they want to go this route. Right. What problems are associated? If I, file, if I fill out the paperwork and follow your plan and say, send it off to the Secretary of State and say, I'm laying claim to Kent Hovind, the corporation. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what, what what's the pitfalls? What do I have to be careful of? Well, one of the, the beautiful things about doing this is a lot of people are very uh, or expecting that this total change in their life that's going to make everything instantly impossible for them. Um, they're used to trying to get rid of that social security number and and refuse mail that doesn't come addressed completely right. And the the way I put it was a breath of fresh air to realize that I really don't have to change that much. I can go ahead and continue living my life as I'm living it and continue to utilize that social security number. Okay, I don't so have to get rid of it. They created a social security number. You just keep using it, you're saying? I privatized it. You privatized record it? Record it into my, my commercial affairs. Mm -hmm. And so I go ahead and I keep using that because it's difficult and you really got to know the law and you really got to get an arm wrestle when you try and walk into a bank and get, get them to open a bank account for you without a social security number or EIN number. And a lot of they people... They won't do it because the bank is tied in with... Well, a lot of people are shocked to find out that, yes, you can do that. Okay. <clears throat> but it, the, the amount of effort that it takes, the normal person out there trying to uh, work out a living for themselves doesn't have the time to go and, and investigate and mm -hmm. research and study and study. And if I'm going to study, I'd rather be studying the Word of God than memorizing all of the legalism that Satan has been creating for the last 200 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, that's the thing I like about, about the system is you don't have to uh, get rid of all these things, which is the traditional way a lot of people have been doing it, but you just lay, lay claim to it and privatize it as, as yours, basically, is what you do. So the bank that you go down and fill out the application to get a bank account and put that number on there, they don't realize that it's privatized. Or do they care? Does it matter? I don't think that little lady, as long as she, she gets a number from you, she's going to give you that bank account. So, are you asking? Is that sticking your head in a noose? They're asking for trouble later. I, I don't believe it is. No. Because you have privatized it. That That's here. correct. Okay. So, if they study and find out, okay, yes, we're trapped. We've made ourselves uh, uh, a bed. We have to lay in it now. If you go in and say, I rescind my social security number, and some people do this. Mm -hmm. They're shocked to find out 20 years later the government did not rescind it. still there. It's still there. That's right. Sure. See, because what happened, the government used them as collateral and security to borrow money, and their blood, sweat, and tears was pledged to pay that loan back for the government. Sure. So th that account was basically used to create money. All right, and they borrowed money against it. They can't just, you know, hit delete in their computer because now they got a big bookkeeping uh, problem because they've already borrowed money against it. Right. So if a person um, such as myself stopped using their social security number 25, 30 years ago, okay, didn't use it for anything, uh, I went down to the social security office and said, can you look up this number for me, please? My number from 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Sure, no problem. Here's your name. <laughs> I said, how much have I paid in? And I had paid in for several years, and all of a sudden there's zero, 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 zero for many, many years. But right. I'm still in there. Yes. I filled out the paperwork when I got ordained. That mm -hmm. They said, you fill out these papers, you can drop out of Social Security. I did all that. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? They still have me. Yes. So the options are try to fight that the rest of your life or accept it, ask for a new card, which has the new a number on the back is very interesting. That's your account number at the bank, right? At the right, at yes. the Federal Reserve Bank. That's so, right. 
So get a new card after 92. Then um, if you use that, you go through the steps of filing certain papers to privatize that, to redeem this straw man. And really, nothing changes much in your lifestyle, but you now are back up here as a free man right. under God's you know, authority. It, it's kind of like when somebody accepts Christ as their Savior. You know, what changes? You know, what well, you don't have to do anything. There's an internal change that happens. Right. And um, it's the freedom that you experience is overwhelming. Right. And it, by accepting Christ, it does not put you under a great big long list of laws and do's and don'ts. It, it's total. People think it does, though. It's tragic. Total freedom. I see Christians it's, that they think, or people are, well, if I become a Christian, I got this big long list. You know, the, the, the way I see it, Christianity is kind of like being on railroad tracks. Okay? And, and a lot of times words are deceptive. Right. You know? Sometimes the, the, the most restricting th thing in the world is free will. Because once you exercise that free will, that choice has just locked out every other possibility and has put you on a specific track or a specific mm -hmm. path. And what, like a, if we have two, two trains, one's not on railroad tracks, see how far it's going to go. Sure. And another's on railroad tracks. You know, it, it's like there's a lot of freedom within the confines of marriage. Stay on the track. You, you go a lot faster than you will trying to go on the gravel. Exactly. Right. Okay. Okay, so we've made all these contracts, marriage license, driver's license, etc. We just simply privatize them. They become, they belong to me now. That's right. And so do you, does the, and the government says you have to renew this driver's license. Send us 50 bucks, please, or something. What do you do? If you wanted to, you could go down and, and, and renew that. Or you could use a commercial process on that. And is that would take I mean, hours and hours to explain a commercial process? Yeah, it probably would. Okay. Get, get, get into it, and we'd, we're, we'd talk another couple hours probably. Because basically, when they created this straw man, they mm -hmm. created an account, and you could direct them to pay that straw man's bills. That's right. Out of that account. That's right. Now you can't go get all that money and say, "Send it to me, please." You know, but you can. Let's say. Let's say they want 50 bucks for a driver's license to renew it. You could direct the Secretary of the Treasury to pay that $50. Out of your DTA. Out of your DTA. Designated direct, tre better. direct Treasury account. Direct Treasury account. Okay, I know we're going to get a 1,000 phone calls, and that's what I don't want uh, if people see this tape. Uh, I don't want to hear any more about it because I don't know any more about it, okay? <laughs> uh, there are people that will help. Uh, right Way Law. Right Way Law helps people. Jack Smith and the guys out there, the right way law. They've been studying the law for years and they encourage people, look, study the law, obey the law. I think everybody should obey the law, even the government. Okay. Even the government. Even the government, sure. I'm not trying to break the law. Um, so, if you want to get a bank loan, it's no problem. You just go down and they ask fill out the Fill out the paperwork. Fill out the paperwork. And get a loan. I, I just have problems with the Christian going down and getting loans. Yeah, we should try to, oh, no, man, anything. That's right. right. But some people, the reason a lot of churches don't want to get unincorporated is because if they get unincorporated, they feel they can no longer give out tax receipts for their members who give money, right. which goes back to what Jesus said, the love of money is the root of all evil. The fact of the matter is you can give out a tax receipt if you want. You that, that's right. You know, I think... I give out receipts to people. If they donate to my ministry, we can give them a receipt. Yes. I'm not a 501c3 corporation. We give them receipts all day long. You know, that's no right. No problem. I think the other thing people need to do, they, they need to start reading some of the foundational law that set the country up. They need to go, and most people don't even know, how do I get a copy of my state constitution? You mean my state even has a constitution? Right. They don't even know that. And you read the state constitutions, and most of the state constitutions I've seen, churches are exempt from taxes. Right. They don't have to file. It's just a matter in their constitution that they can't tax the church. So... Um, there's a lot of misconceptions people have, and uh, those misconceptions are basically, you know, what Christ was even fighting, tradition. You know, the, it's a misconception for such a long period of time that it now becomes tradition, and everybody does it. Well, because everyone's done it, and everyone sure. has always done it. So we need to start looking and, and reading some of the foundational documents. All right. Well, we'll add more to this tape uh, from time to time. We want to encourage you to uh, don't get distracted 
on things of this world that are not going to matter anyway. Uh, I, I think we should try very hard to keep ourselves directly accountable to God. But I see an awful lot of Christians get distracted, wasting hours and hours and hours on what some people call the patriot movement, whatever mm -hmm. that is. You know, I don't know what it is. Um, but you know, spend thousands of hours uh, on things that are, they're not going to matter after five seconds after you're dead anyway. Right. You know, let's go win souls and you know Amen. preach the gospel. But the, the concept of redeeming the straw man has been fascinating to me as I listened through the tape seminar while I was driving. I listened to the audio tapes from Right Way Law, and it was it was interesting that. Uh, we have really let them take us into captivity and it's not that hard to redeem yourself that's right to get out of that it's easy so there's another factor though that i think some people miss because i'm not under the law here i could drive 100 miles an hour 200 miles an hour on the interstate if i wanted as long as i don't hurt anybody according to my constitution right i can i cannot be deprived of my property without due process and that has to there has to be an injured party if I don't wear a seat belt, I didn't injure anybody. That's right. The state can require their person to wear a seat belt because that belongs to them and they're concerned about him. Right. But if I've redeemed him, yeah. it doesn't well, matter. It's interesting because in Florida, the speed statute that cops love to write is 316.183. And if you get a ticket, I can almost guarantee you that's a statute they're going to write on lawful speed. And if you know how to follow that law through, you look at the statute, and at the bottom of the statute gives history and things like that, and then there is something called the administrative code. Right. And a lot of people don't even know there's the administrative code, and they don't know how it's the administrative code going hand in hand with the statute that has the force and effect of law. And they don't know how to look all that stuff up, but you go through to the, you're implementing regulations, and 316.183 was enacted so that the state could regulate its school bus drivers. Has nothing to do with the average driver anyway. Does it has it? nothing to do with the average driver. The helmet law. The state would like its troopers, when they're out driving around on their Harleys, to make sure they have helmets on. That makes a lot of sense. I used to have a sign business, and I told guys when they used the saw, they had to have safety glasses. Well, when they punched out at the end of the day, went home and used their saw, if they want to wear safety glasses, they did. Sure. You know, my, my company smart. policy did not apply to them at home. Uh -huh. So what they try and do, the, the, the state comes and passes policy for its highway troopers, and they want everyone to, to, to follow it when that law doesn't apply to everyone. Sure. It doesn't have that authority. Well, the other factor, let's take seat belt. Okay, I've redeemed my straw man. Mm -hmm. I don't have to wear my seat belt if I don't want to. Number one, it's smart to wear your seat belt. Amen. Number two, I don't want my liberty to be a stumbling block to others. That's right. Yes, I can drive 200 miles an hour as long as I don't hurt anybody. And, and if you were... Uh, out no, it's a bad in, testimony. If you were out in Nevada, in the desert, there's no one around, may, maybe if you wanted to, right? But I don't believe as a Christian I can go 200 miles an hour through town or out on I-75. Um, I don't believe my old man will do 200 miles an hour anyway, but <laughs> the Spirit won't let me. <coughs> so um, it's, you know, and the other thing I think what a lot of people need to do is they need to go down to the courts, find out when they're having criminal, criminal traffic proceedings. Right? Guys driving on suspended license, drunk driving, things like that. And you're going to find out that there's so many uh, uh, paying customers, I mean people that have been uh, arrested, that it's supposed to be a public proceeding, but they got so many people that have been charged that if you don't have uh, an information against you or a ticket against you, you won't even get a seat. And that's how many people are in here. But you're going to see this, that the court hasn't even been in session 15 minutes and they're up over $40,000 in fines. I was amazed to find guys who were DUI, right, that they got in wrecks, they hurt people. No jail time, a $5,000 fine, five years probation, with one of the terms of probation at the end of five years is that you've paid the $5,000 fine, all right? So if you violate your probation, then they can throw you in jail for the full, full jail sentence. So what they're doing, they're using the jail sentence over here as a hammer holding it over your head saying, you better pay this fine because if you don't pay the fine, we're going to throw you in jail. See, they don't want to throw you in jail for DUI. They want you to be, be paying fines. That's what that's the name of the game with DUI. Right. You know, it was like a, a, a conversation I had with a guy. I was waiting for a, a table at a restaurant and I was talking to this guy and I, I told him, I said, I, I personally don't agree with the DUI laws. And he looked at me like I was his best friend. You know, he personally had three or four DUIs. Every time he uh, 
gotten in accidents or people that were hurt, he hadn't gone to jail yet. And uh, he had one, one fine of $5,000. The next time he got $7,000 and the fines are just going up, up, up. And he's, you know, working, goes down to the, his probation officer and he's making his, his, all his little payments. payments. Right. And, and he, he knows he can drive as drunk as he wants. He, he's just going to have to keep getting the, these, these fines that he has to pay. And, uh, he, boy, he, he thought I was his best friend when I said I disagree with the DUI. And I said, the real issue should be if you are incapable of controlling yourself, I don't care if you haven't had any beers, right? And you drive in an irresponsible manner and, and, and you hurt someone, right? Especially you kill someone, you should be in the hot seat. Well, he looked at me like I was the worst thing in the world. Right. And he said, if it was that way, I would go to 7-Eleven and buy a case of beer and go home and drink it. And I was like, imagine that. Personal <laughs> accountability. Sure. If you'd That's have the to, Bible's full of that, that, exactly. Personal accountability. But see, if people were personally accountable, they couldn't make all this money through this corrupt system. court system. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Well, good. Well, John, we sure appreciate your time, and there's a million other th uh, rabbit trails I'd like to go down. I've got quite a list here in front of me. Um, I, I, I don't want Christians who haven't discovered their liberty mm -hmm. to get mad at me because I have. Right. And yeah. that, that's what happens. It's really sad. Yeah, and, and all I can say is when you meet someone who has discovered what's going on, there's a whole another world out there that you may not have stumbled upon. And so if somebody's out there driving without a driver's license, um, it may be sinful for you at that point to get rid of your driver's license um, because if you honestly believe that... Um, that, that, that God had ordained that government in, in that a driver's license was a valid exercise of legislative authority, then I think you need to have that driver's license. But if you have went in, if you personally went and you saw your, your deacons at your church, you know, you, you went to pick up your hat you forgot on a Monday morning and you saw the deacons sitting there laughing in the back room and, and they were taking all the money that came in it and they were giving it to the church of Satan saying, those dumb Christians... What would you do? Would you say, well, God put those elders in there and I just have to follow them and I gave it in good faith so, you know, God's going to bless me. Well, once you had knowledge of the corruption that was going on there, you need to, one, tell the other people in the church what the deacons are doing with your money and now if next Sunday you didn't <laughs> tell everyone, you come in and you continue giving that money knowing that it's being used for satanic purposes, I don't believe God would bless that offering yeah, at that point at that in time. Point you're liable. So, if people have discovered exactly what the alleged government has done to us, and they are exercising their liberties, and they are doing so at a great risk of being thrown in jail and things like that, um, I would not be ridiculing them. I would not be judging them. But, like I say, we need to, to study so we will know how to properly apply Scripture. Sure. Two movies that, uh, I don't go off on two more hour rabbit trail here. We won't do that. But if people watch The, the Wizard of Oz. Yes. The Yellow Brick Road. The, yeah, that, that's amazing because that's all full of uh, symbolism. You know? They spelled out the whole plan. The Yellow Brick Road is the money. You follow the money trail. Yes, yes. And the straw and, man and, 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 has no and, brain. And that, <laughs> that came out like in 1938. The U.S. was bankrupted in 1933. You know, bankruptcy is like a legal proceeding. And uh, um, Dorothy was told if she didn't hand over that, that dog, Toto, right, and this lawsuit was going to be filed, it was going to take the whole farm. And, uh, you know, th th then, then when she woke up, we're not in Kansas anymore. Well, hello, state, state of Kansas. In, in, in Kansas, you know, th there was a fiction, right? So she was now in this fictional... Went from the reality to the fiction, across that mirror. The, the wizard's amazing. It... Uh, they get to the end, they're looking for the, this great Oz, and uh, all of a sudden, they find out who he really is. A little man behind the curtain. Tiny little, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they ain't no attention to that little man behind the curtain. Right, right. right. And it's uh, just like what's talked about in Scripture here in uh, Isaiah uh, 14, and it, it, where you start reading the, the, the fall of uh, Lucifer, and it talks about, uh, here at verse 16, it says, they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, 
Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake the kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? This is the guy who did it. Is, is this the great wizard? Satan's going to be a little guy. We're all going to see Jesus just toss him into hell for a thousand years. It's amazing. you know. Yeah. It's Now I look at him completely different. It, it, not as a powerful guy. He's this tiny little dweeb that you could probably flick out, out of your life. But he's the only thing, the the only thing yeah. he's got going for himself is deception. Yeah. And he appears to be very powerful. He appears to... And it is an incredible deception. Yeah, which is exactly what the Wizard of Oz was. Exactly. The other movie is The Matrix. <coughs> That's now a, these, these are heathen movies, right? Put out and some bad language and all this kind of stuff. But the concept they're getting across is the same thing about the two different worlds. Yes, that's right. Now you know it's amazing. A lot of people don't understand why we teach art to children in school, and why schools have always had art in there. And that's very simply because art, you, you look at art and you see a cross-section of where your society is at that point in time. If you look at art from the 16th century or, or look at art during the Dark Ages, you know, there wasn't a lot of art going on then. And, but then you look at the, the Renaissance and all this stuff, and, and you can get a good cross-section. Akvorkian, in his paintings, you know, he, he's got pictures of guys just clawing and scraping down into like this pit fighting for their life and uh, you look at his paintings and you can tell what he's like right and uh, same thing with, with, with art you know movies are just another you know form of art and you look at a movie and you can basically see where your society is by looking at that art and, and as our society's gone down the tubes you can see that depicted in, in the, the, the movies of, the, of that day and the same thing with, with Wizard of Oz. You know, earlier I was talking about notice and grace. And I think this is one way that we are given notice to what's happened to us. It, it's interesting, in, in the, the, the Wizard of Oz, that was first writ, written in a book called The Emerald City. And Dorothy's slippers were silver. But when they made the movie, they switched it to ruby because they figured that with so much symbolism, people would have easily realized what had happened to them going through the Great Depression. They took their silver away. Exactly. So they, they change it from silver slippers to ruby slippers, and it was the silver slippers following the, the, the golden road back, and, and that was how Dorothy could actually get from down here, the fictional state, back up to the real Kansas, follow the gold, find out what the bankers did to the country, and uh, that there was your answer. So Matrix, uh, again, a lot of symbolism, and I can see how how we've all been sucked into the fiction. The, the Matrix is a fiction, and, and we got the web, the Internet, and there's a lot of symbolism going on there. And, and ultimately, there's a question that talks about, do you want the red blue pill or the blue pill? If you take the blue pill, you, you won't have any knowledge of the Matrix, how it works. Or the red pill, you can go and live your life, you have knowledge of the Matrix, and you can try and make the, the appropriate changes for good. I want the red pill. <laughs> Some people don't want to know. <clears throat> they, right. they prefer ignorance. Ignorance is bliss. They're having a blizzard. Leave them alone. Okay? Uh, our founding fathers that started this country a couple hundred years ago, a few, about 3% of the population, supported them. That's the right. vast majority said, we don't care. We don't care if we serve King George. We don't care who it is. You know, just tell us who won when, we're over, when it's over. Right. Okay? And an awful lot of people are in that state today. And a uh, very small percentage followed George Washington you know, and we're willing to to risk all. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad they did. Uh, yep. Matter of fact, everybody today is glad they did. We put their money, we put their faces on our money, and we, you know, build big statues in our courthouse, et cetera, et cetera. But had we been in that same situation, a small percentage, it, it, nothing's changed, three or four percent. Right. Still fighting the battle. <clears throat> and it, it amazes me how that, you know, my ministry's all on creation, evolution, because I think evolution, the idea that man is God is really the foundation of this whole fiction. That's right. That's right. And so I want to reach it right at the root of everything else. And this stuff about IRS and Social Security, this is a little rabbit trail that I don't want to waste a lot of time on. But it is, I think it's, it's part of the major, it's part of the fiction. That's right. And so I think people need to be exposed to it. And should you choose to say, hey, that's a battle worth fighting, I don't have time to fight every battle in the world. I, de I decided I can't pick up every piece of litter on the highway. I can't fix everybody's broken car in the world. 
I can't fix everybody's, you know, plugged up sink in the world. Mm -hmm. I know how to do that. I just don't have time to do everybody's, okay? Right. Yes. I have to pick and choose which battles are worth fighting. As in my seminar, 15 hours long, I kick a lot of dogs as I walk by and say, hey, if you, by the way, if you want more, follow this trail. There's a lot more information there. That's right. But I'd like to encourage people uh, as we kick this dog about, you know, IRS and redeeming your straw man, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, don't waste a lot of time, you know. Stay with the focus of getting people saved. That's right. You know, and then once you get them saved, ground them and get them going so they can go produce more fruit. That's right. But if we're, if we've made ourselves slaves, um, all through the all through the Bible, you see where the children of Israel fell into slavery, and then they begged God, "Get me out of this." Yes, you know? that's right. Uh, I've experienced the freedom of being in the real world instead of the fictional world. Uh, I, I believe I'm pretty well out, and it's wonderful. Yes, it is. And I'll take the red pill too. I'd like to know. Some people don't want to know. Some but people what, say, what's even worse after people know and that they're aware that there's a decision to make, then they say, "Give me the blue." Sure. And I can't help those people. That's right. There's nothing you can do for them. If you That's want right. the blue pill, just take it, you know. But uh, some people say, as far as the future, you know, they don't want to study prophecy and what's coming with the mark of the beast and the world, you know, everybody being killed. And they don't want to know all that. Well, I think I'd rather know. Uh, me too. I'd rather walk in with my eyes wide open, knowing, hey, you're about to be shot. Yes. You know? Yeah, well, okay. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, you know, they all face their trials. Jesus grew up under Roman control. All the disciples did, all their, their whole life, under Roman oppression, you know, under the thumb. Uh, Joseph sold to slavery, you know, to be a, down to Pharaoh. And the children of Israel lived under slavery. You can live for God under any situation. That's right. It's a little easier under some than others, and I'd rather not be, you know, stretched on the rack and tortured and have my skin ripped off and all this kind of stuff. But it, it's happened. Yes, it has. And it's going to happen again. And, and they have a great reward in heaven. Sure. And it's easy for us to sit here, you know, and say that when we're not in pain. That's right. Uh, but it, it's happened all across the country. You know, people say, um, <clears throat> you know, we're going to be out of here before the tribulation. Well, I'm, I'm with you. I believe Christians are going to be raptured out also. But tell that to the Chinese Christians. That's a very good point. They're already going through it, you know. Yes. I mean, right now, they're being dragged out of their churches. And just for going to church, they break their ankles. That's correct. And I believe even if we're right and we're out of here, before the Great Tribulation, I think we are going to be persecuted terribly before that happens. Yeah. And, and I think as a result of that persecution, there is going to be a great revival. Because so many people have bought this fiction, and they have this total allegiance to this fiction, <coughs> and they defend this fiction almost more vigorously than they, they will defend God. Right. And I think when this fiction starts killing people like what Hitler did to, to his citizenry, because there wasn't just Jews, there were, he persecuted Jehovah Witnesses terribly. Oh, yeah. And, and his political opponents, he, he was just merciless to. And uh, I, I think after the system finally starts doing that to people, people are going to get their eyes off of this system and look to God. And I think we're going to see that, that great revival but I think the, the catalyst thing that's going to make it happen is this a total, total persecution. And, and shame, then yeah. after the revival, I think that's when you're going to see the rapture. Unless the trap is so carefully laid this time. You know, there have been conspiracies all through history, you know, for one world government. But this time, it, with computers, and it's the trap is so carefully laid, this is going to be difficult, if not impossible, to. Mm -hmm. You're going to reach that point where you've got to decide, oh, are you going to stand or are you going to bow and kiss the dirt? That's it. And uh, it's a fascinating study, and uh, I certainly, John, appreciate your time. Have you taken all your time to explain this? And I would like to see people know more about this. With the caution, don't spend the next 30 years doing this and forget winning souls. That's yes, what we're be, because that can just totally <coughs> suck you into the point that all you're doing, you're, you're, you're reading volumes and volumes of man's law, and, and you're forgetting all about Scripture. Forget God's law. You yeah. know, don't be do aware that. to what's going on so you can see it. Because I have a much more appreciation for the scripture, and I think I'm a lot closer to seeing things 2020, right? Knowing what's going on in the the Satan's fictional world, and how those two are going hand in glove with what the Bible's talking about. Sure. Well, Amen. Yep. Let's not get distracted. When so, it's so easy on, on every every topic, you know. When We're distracted souls. with a basketball or distracted with a, you know. And I've got some major Christian ministries that used to be close friends of mine. 
mm -hmm. that have blackballed me and ostracized me because I, I've discovered there's a mirror here and I'm seeing both sides and say, wait a minute now, I think I'm going to be I'm going to be accountable to God. That's right. And because I do not uh, have a 501c3 corporation, I do not uh, uh, fill out any income tax forms. They think, oh, Hovind's a tax. I'm not a tax radical. I'm not a tax. I'm not rebelling. That's right. I'm trying very hard to obey the law. <laughs> exactly. The real law. The whole law. I'm trying awfully hard. And at the same time, I don't want to get distracted on this. It's, my it's amazing. My 15-hour seminar has about an eight-second statement mm -hmm. that says, when I mention how evolution ties in with communism and Karl Marx was anti-God in everything he did, and he invented the graduated income tax system that we have here. Right. And all I say is, by the way, Karl Marx invented the income tax, and it's voluntary. And I go right on with my seminar. That one little eight-second statement has brought me who knows how many thousands of phone calls. So we've got a letter explaining, you know, why I say that, and that's what I want to have this video for. If somebody wants more information, um, you know, maybe this will help explain. It is voluntary, if un unless you're still down here. That's right. If you haven't redeemed your straw man, well, then you, you better do what they say, right? That's it. And, and it's amazing if, if people would just read his, the, his ten planks of communism. Right, folks. We have a communistic. Government. We're, we're, That's communist, what we we're have. communistic right now. Okay. Yes, sir. Yep. Yep. Here's communism. A brief statement of communism. Satan against God. Right. I just got back from Chicago, and I visited some friends up there, and there was a young guy who recently came to, to the Lord, and one of his professors, you know, is a sworn communist, uh -huh. and he tells them that pure communism is the ideal form of governance. But what they're telling them now is, oh, what they had in Russia. That wasn't pure communism. Why? Because we know that was a failure. So, so now what do they have to tell them? They got to lie to them and say, "Well, that wasn't pure communism." Right. Okay. Here's here's basically why I say it's Satan against God. A lot of people have no idea of what the word trespass really means. Okay. And before you can have a trespass, you have to first establish a right. Okay. After I've established a right, like the life. From God gave me life and you trespass and you take that life away from me you didn't have the right to that life I did God gave it to me so you first have to establish a right in Karl Marx's first plank of communism is abolition of all private property right well now where did he get the authority to do that you see God gave us that right in what the first plank of communism is all about is rebelling against God in saying that God, you don't have the authority to give people prov private property rights. That's what it is. And we can go through each one of those planks of communism and, and show you where it is very venomous, anti-God. Anti-God, all the way through. The whole thing. And that's all I'm trying to get across. And, uh, I would have to say, I'm not sorry that I mentioned in my seminar about the IRS. Um, I am uh, I am aware of the fact that it there's a great learning curve to bring the average American who knows who's down here right who knows nothing about any of this there's a tremendous learning curve to bring him up to speed where it's all of a sudden wow now I understand right and the people that are still down here might look at somebody who's got his freedom and say well that what's wrong with him anyway right you know well, there's nothing wrong with me I'm trying to obey God you know that's it so but I sure have to fight against the uh, the tendency to waste a lot of time and get distracted with that you know and uh, and I appreciate people like you that, that study this and understand it and are willing to help people. You know, mm -hmm. you've got some questions, you know. And there are many other people who want to help. Uh, I want to help introduce them to the subject, and then I want to leave it and go on and do something else. Okay. Right. I yeah. want to win souls and, and get people uh, converted over uh, from believing in evolution, because I think it's the foundation. So we're headed for trouble in this country, uh, in the world. It's coming fast, and everybody's yes, sound asleep. Just going to run right over them and not even know what happened. Sad. And uh, well, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Any final thoughts? We've things we did not cover. And things you want to get on here real quick? Yeah, I think that pretty much sums it up there. Okay. Get the citizens' rule book. Study the Constitution, but don't let that be a distraction from studying God's word and God's law. That's the basis of all truth. And always keep in mind the love of money is the root of all evil. Not the lack of money, <laughs> which some people think. Yes. <laughs> the love, of, the money. love nothing, of money. Nothing wrong with money. And it's a necessary, but we don't have any money. We have a Federal Reserve note, which is a whole other can of worms that can go for six hours. But if you read those books that you mentioned, uh, The Creature from Jekyll Island, 
and the uh, one about the Rockefeller. That was remember the title to that one. I've got the books. I've read them, but uh, yeah, the, the, there's a, a, a bunch of them. Uh, a host of books. We'll put the names and addresses up on the screen. If you want to get off into this study, if I can caution you, keep serving God. Nothing else is going to matter. That's, that's what's right. most important. Thank you so much. Appreciate yeah. it, John.